Um, hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, second So Chic webinar. Um, today, we will be um, hearing about uh, uh, air sea fluxes, and we will be hearing from Seb Swart from uh, the University of Gothenburg in Sweden, uh, Mario Hoppema from the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany and Brian Ward from the National University of Ireland in Galway. Uh, my name is Joseph Nolan from the European Polar Board Secretariat. Uh, I'll be uh, moderating this webinar today. Um, before we start, just a few bits of housekeeping that the webinar is being recorded um, and will be available online uh, afterwards on the Soshi YouTube channel. So anybody who's uh, not able to attend at this time can catch up. And also if you miss something, you can always go back to see it. We'll let you know when that's um, posted online. Um, if you have any questions from any of the presentations of the speakers or comments and so on, during the webinar. Um, we will save those to the end and do them all together, I think is the best way. Um, so to, to put your questions, you can use, there is the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. You should find that there. You can type in your questions. Um, or if you prefer, you can um, indicate, I think you have a, um, a button where you can uh, raise your hand virtually and indicate you'd like to ask a question. Um, and we can try and get to you and you can ask your question via audio. Um, there is also a chat box. So um, for any more discussions about the presentations or between attendees or a few links to publications that are relevant, um, that's a good place to share those and everyone can, everyone can see that as well. And yes, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Seb, who's going to uh, give the first presentation. Seb. Great, thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Um, I will just share screen, and I hope that, well, Joseph can confirm that you can see a PowerPoint presentation. Yep, looks good. Great. Um, well, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, it's really great to have this opportunity for us in Sochik uh, on Work Package 1, which is dealing with surface uh, air-sea fluxes in the Southern Ocean, to be able to present to you today some of our plans and science rationale for this project. Uh, firstly, thanks so much to the European Polar Board and to Joseph for doing such a great job at uh, organizing the webinar and uh, getting the interest of so many people. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, and of course, this is a series of webinars for So Chic. Uh, I hope that some of you have managed to catch JB's uh, one a few months ago, which gave us a great introduction uh, to the project as a whole. Uh, and now, you know, in, now and in the near future, the opportunity to go into the details of all the work packages uh, for science uh, that are part of SOCHIC uh, in these separate individual webinars. So we have a obviously a very large audience today and it means that we have to try and find a good balance of uh, being uh, general uh, on our topics and also trying to show you a little bit of the detail uh, of what we would like to do within SOCHIC. Um, and so I hope we can try and do that. And, and because of that, we've split ourselves up into, uh, within these three members of the work package one, myself, uh, Mario and Brian, and that's to try and give you a bit of taste of uh, the different areas of the work package itself and show you a little bit of detail, for example, with Brian showing his ASIP instrument later to give you a little bit of an in-depth understanding of some of the observational coverage. So without further ado, um, I will take this opportunity to uh, introduce the broader SOCIC uh, Work Package 1 team. And uh, what I hope to get across to you is that what's really nice about this 
consortium, let's call that, is with this combination of people who really want to work on issues around heat, momentum, and carbon dioxide, air sea fluxes in the Southern Ocean. And I think this is quite unique because it's not in instances or come together from physical to gas fluxes uh, in one space to try and address some of these problems uh, in the Southern Ocean. And so here you can see uh, the core members of the team, um, myself, and uh, who's more in heat, uh, look interested in heat. I'm a bit of an imposter. I can't call myself a heat flux expert, but I'm very interested in it and hope to learn a lot in So Chic. And then we have a lot of experts uh, around carbon and heat. Uh, Mario, who's going to give us some details about the CO2 later. Uh, Pedro Monteiro and Sarah Nicholson at CSIR, which is a South African partner in this project. Jacqueline Bouton at Carbon uh, at Soborn. Marcel Duplessis is a postdoc within Sochi here at University of Gothenburg looking at heat. Simon Josie in Southampton at NOC looking at uh, really an expert in global and Southern Ocean heat fluxes. And Brian, uh, who uh, specializes on these dissipation measurements and their impact on carbon and heat fluxes. And we have a collaborator, Seb Moreau at MPI, who's looking at the biogeochemistry, which is a nice element to bringing in this understanding of the carbon and heat together from a biogeochemical perspective. So uh, to quickly get you into the feeling of the Southern Ocean, I will show you this uh, video um, of what it's like to be in the Southern Ocean. Uh, here we have these rolling waves and pretty rough conditions. Here's a nice big wave rolling past the camera, probably two stories or more high. And so uh, this video is kind of just giving you a feeling of what it's like to be there. Uh, if you were standing on a ship uh, taking this video or trying to collect these observations, here's a nice blue skies, but usually it's actually like this, pretty rough and nasty place to be. And it's very difficult to collect observations, as you can see in these kind of conditions around the surface uh, ocean in the Southern Ocean. Here's ice, uh, big waves, big winds and storms that make things difficult for science. And you think maybe this is collected from a ship, uh, these videos, but in fact, it's actually collected from autonomous platform. Uh, in this case, it was the sail drone, which uh, completed its first circumnavigation of Antarctica by an autonomous platform, collecting these observations at the surface interface between the ocean and the atmosphere of air sea fluxes and of the upper ocean itself. And I'll come back to this a little bit later about how sail drone and other autonomous platforms really plug a, a big observational gap for us in, in we believe in Sochik and we hope to achieve that. So when we look at the Southern Ocean, a lot of us people who work in this area love to use this kind of image uh, that Mike Meredith uh, published last year, which puts Antarctica and the Southern Ocean in spillhouse projection in the middle of the map. Um, and what's great about that is that it really emphasizes this connection uh, that the Southern Ocean provides for all the ocean basins, the Atlantic and the Indian and the Pacific Ocean. And in that sense, it's really a gateway uh, by which heat and carbon and other very important uh, properties like nutrients and biochemical cycling really connects in the Southern Ocean for the global ocean. And of course, it's uh, also a very, very important part of where excess heat that we put in the environment and carbon actually enter the ocean. So of all the ocean carbon, 50% of it enters in the Southern Ocean and 75% of the oceanic heat uh, goes in by the Southern Ocean. And if it, you know, that to bring that more to real uh, reality is that if you were driving your non-electric car to work or wherever you might go, about one in five molecules of carbon dioxide would actually enter the ocean through the Southern Ocean. So it's really significant. And of course, without the Southern Ocean and this gateway and distribution of heat and other properties around the globe, essentially we wouldn't have a habitable planet. So it's really core to our um, climate sciences and understanding how the Earth works uh, as a whole. And that's really why SOCHIC uh, will focus on the Southern Ocean so that it may understand these pathways of carbon and heat 
uh, entering the Southern Ocean or outgassing in the Southern Ocean back into the atmosphere and how this might impact uh, our climate now and in the future as we uh, understand and predict the impacts of climate change around the world. Now there's a lot of details about uh, SOCIC which I won't really be able to get into today. My focus today um, and Mario and Brian is to focus on work package one um, and which is around the air sea fluxes. But you can see here that we have a number of other work packages that deal with key processes in the Southern Ocean to understand their uh, feedback into the climate system. And this is really supported by strong activities around data management and like today, uh, dissemination of information through uh, Work Package 8 and the European Polar Board and their work that they're doing. Now to give you a little bit of a perspective of more, uh, you know, realistic looking at how, how this sits in the Southern Ocean, you can see that Work Package 1 dealing on the air sea fluxes is really understanding this atmospheric signal of climate uh, entering or exiting in the Southern Ocean for heat and carbon. And uh, linked to this very closely, and which I won't be able to get into detail today, is Work Package 2, which is looking at the upper ocean processes and how these uh, heat and carbon and other properties can be ventilated uh, within the upper ocean and how that may be then connected to the deep ocean interior where these uh, properties can be stored for centuries to thousands of years um, uh, in the ocean interior. And related to that is also work package four on Polinias, which we'll hear about, I'm sure, in one of these webinars in the near future. And then work package five and six, which is about looking how these uh, properties are exported and how they may impact the climate system as a whole and through the uptake and storage of these uh, heat and carbon in the global ocean. Now this uh, nice depiction of JB in one of his papers of the Southern Ocean on the right is a very nice idealized view of the Southern Ocean. But in fact, when we uh, take a closer, uh, this now quite old image from Kevin Spencer really demonstrates just how many processes are at play in a place like the Southern Ocean that have an impact on heat and carbon air sea fluxes. Uh, there's many things going on here. It's, um, very complex in terms of the processes that are resolved in both the ocean and the atmosphere, uh, such as ocean mixing, uh, ocean eddies and currents, uh, atmospheric storms that move over the system, and all of these processes interacting together at very, very uh, short and uh, time and space scales uh, are really very complex. And unfortunately, this area is a real knowledge uh, gap for us because it's so complex and yet we have so few observations uh, in these areas of the global ocean. And in order to further highlight this, um, I use this animation here of Sarah Nicholson's just showing the wind speed uh, over the Southern Ocean. And you can see at what, what temporal and spatial scales a simple thing like wind speed varies at in the Southern Ocean. So these are satellite derived winds and you can see that we have these very strong pulses of uh, high wind speeds from storms followed by low wind speeds that vary very rapidly in time and in space. And all of these things, you know, things such as wind speed varying like this has a, a strong impact on how we understand and observe these uh, air sea fluxes occurring at that air sea interface. So it's a very complex and variable system to understand and observe. And this is just one way to demonstrate that. Now, I, my focus uh, here in, in this first part of today's webinar is on heat um, and mostly heat and momentum. And after that, Mario Hoppema is going to take over from me and get into details about uh, CO2 and carbon. Um, and so, I'm going to demonstrate a little bit to try and in the short time show you why uh, heat flux is an important thing when it comes to the Southern Ocean. And first of all, in the top panel here, we can see an ensemble mean of 12 different satellite reanalysis products showing the net heat flux in and out of the ocean, red colors being into the ocean. And what we can see here is that 
globally, the Southern Ocean has these very strong signals of heat fluxes and is therefore a very important place by which heat can exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean. Now, there's a lot of uncertainty in these estimates, and that's really demonstrated by this bottom panel and this nice review done by Lisa and you uh, two years ago, which shows the standard deviation of all of these 12 heat flux products. And the standard deviations are very high, you know, up to watts per square meter in the Southern Ocean, large portions of the Southern Ocean. And so there, this really leads to a lot of uncertainty in global heat fluxes because of the Southern Ocean. And so there's lots of work to do uh, in, in order to resolve this area, um, these regions around the, the Antarctic continent in terms of heat flux uncertainty. If we go and look a little bit more detail, um, here we're comparing three different reanalysis products for ASP fluxes of heat. The top panels are three products, ERA-5, JRA, and NCEP-2 of the mean heat flux in and out of the Southern Ocean. And then the bottom panels are showing you the daily difference between these products, the mean daily difference, and also the standard deviation of these daily differences. And not to overwhelm you with all these plots, but it really just shows you the different regions of the Southern Ocean, which uh, products that we use to force our numerical models and climate models and look at our operational forecast for weather, how they get it wrong from one product to the next. Um, and there are these three areas that I simply highlight here showing that these uncertainties around heat flux products uh, are, uh, are regionally specific. For example, the Antarctic polar current regions have high uncertainty in heat fluxes. Uh, the margins, such as the boundaries to the Southern Ocean, where the subtropical gyres or western boundary currents interact, like the Agullis current or the Malvinas area, where they interact with the boundary of the Southern Ocean also has heightened uncertainty. And thirdly, the MIZ, the marginal ice zone, where seasonal ice covers uh, the Southern Ocean and then melts away in the summertime, also presents a lot of uncertainty in our um, estimates of uh, heat air sea fluxes. I'd love to go into a lot more detail, but and there has been actually a lot of great studies that have emerged very recently. I'd say the last two years, there's been a significant amount of studies that are starting to look in detail in uh, the, how the flux of heat and momentum in the Southern Ocean is how variable it is and how it may be changing in the future. And I don't have time to go into all these uh, studies, but here's a list of them that I would point you to, to maybe get some insights if you're not familiar with Southern Ocean uh, heat fluxes. These provide some details from both mooring data that we have in the Southern Ocean, only two sites like the OOI mooring and the SOFS mooring, um, all the way to the use of reanalysis products and then ship-based uh, measurements like eddy covariance and bulk heat fluxes. Uh, so definitely uh, take a chance to read up on some of these very interesting papers that have emerged. Now, why are these uncertainties manifested in the Southern Ocean? Uh, one of the major uh, reasons for that is our major gap in data. And this is another great map by Mike Meredith uh, showing you um, the last 50 or 60 years of ocean temperature data as an example. And the blue areas is where we have hundreds and thousands of observations per square degree. And they're really all biased towards the Northern Hemisphere oceans. Uh, we have a lot of data comparatively of the Northern Hemisphere oceans than we do of the Southern Hemisphere, even though the surface area of the ocean in the Southern Hemisphere is so much greater. And we could really say that these yellow and orange colors where we just have a handful of observations could be described as a data desert. And then there's even areas that are white where there is zero data. And this is usually impacted by places that are covered by sea ice, which makes it very difficult to get observations. So uh, there we have really no idea what's going on in those areas when it comes to ocean observations. And we rely heavily here on numerical modeling to give insight into the processes that are happening here. And we don't have a good sense of how good or bad these numerical models are against observations, areas where we don't have observations. 
More specifically, if we were to look at fluxes, air sea fluxes, so the top two panels are air sea, are observations in the ocean of temperature, surface temperature. But I want you to focus on the two bottom panels. And this is just simply wind speed observation. So in situ measurements that we have of wind speed, uh, summer on the right and winter on the left. And on the right hand side, you can see we have a lot more observations in summer, which is really a function of ship tracks. So ships go down into the Southern Ocean in summertime when you know, there's less ice and conditions are much more favorable. And they can collect observations, for example, of wind speed. But the same map is reproduced here if we were to look at other very simple atmospheric observations like relative humidity or air temperature or core uh, atmospheric measurements that we need to, to estimate heat fluxes. And then you look on the left and we have the winter time and essentially there's no observations here, just a few sprinklings of observations in the last 10 years uh, from the June, July, uh, August period. And two purple dots here represent the two moorings that a lot of studies have relied on recently. Uh, the OOI mooring in the Southeast Pacific and the SOFS mooring south of Tasmania. And you can see that they're usually, they're, they're mostly sampling the Northern domains of the Southern Ocean. So there are really large gaps in the Southern domains and particularly in winter. The black line represents this, the maximum sea ice ex extent. And of course that causes even more complications of collecting data uh, when there are sea ice presence there seasonally. Lisa News work shows that uh, temporarily this June, July, August, September period, basically there's no observations in the Southern Ocean and at the bottom panel is emphasizing in the MIZ regions where there is a total dearth of observations at this time of year. And so Soshik hopes to contribute to filling some of these data gaps. And it's not just about collecting more data per se, but it's also about thinking what kind of data we collect, where we collected, and very importantly, at what scale we collect these observations. So the field site for Soshik um, is, is regarded to as site one and site two. I'm going to just mention site one here. Um, uh, site two is around the Polinia work in work package four, uh, the mode rise and the Weddell Polinia. But in site one, which is going to be in the Weddell Sea in a region which is uh, seasonally covered by ice, we want to deploy uh, with uh, icebreakers, uh, deploy a number of autonomous platforms uh, that can scoot around the surface ocean of the Southern Ocean and collect these rare air sea flux observations of momentum, heat, and carbon. And unfortunately, we've recently learned that due to COVID, we had to delay part of our, our field uh, uh, work plans um, and the core uh, research crews uh, that was planned to start in January uh, 2021, so just in a few months, has had to be delayed by a year. Um, and so um, we hope to, we will still be able to collect these observations, but we have to plan them a year later. And so late 2021 and into 2022, our field program for site one will really get going, which will um, also show a huge component of work package two's uh, deployments around gliders measuring the upper ocean together with the surface platforms. So together simultaneously observing the lower atmosphere and the ocean uh, in one place at the same time. Very briefly, um, the broad aims of this work package is firstly and foremost to obtain a full seasonal cycle of high resolution air sea flux observations of heat, momentum and carbon dioxide. And the focus here is, if, is really on the autumn to winter period where we have this big gap in our understanding due to the lack of observations. There are three uh, sub uh, aims that, that I've tried to more broadly define here. And that's really assessing the magnitudes and scales of variability both in space and time for these air sea fluxes and linking them to these key processes that happen uh, in both the atmosphere and the ocean, such as storms in the atmosphere or ocean fronts and eddies from both the sub mesoscale to the mesoscale and the impact of sea ice cover where we have ship observations going into the sea ice regions. Two is uh, to determine the uncertainties of these satellite reanalysis uh, air sea flux estimates uh, with our new in situ observations that can give us really a, inform us about how how well these satellite reanalysis products do in different regions of the Southern Ocean. 
And then thirdly, as Brian is going to introduce in a short while, the direct dissipation measurements from a profiler in the upper ocean and relate these to our air sea flux observations that we make. And there are a number of other questions that are linked to other work packages, which will be explained in the near future when they uh, unveil their plans, such as work package two on the upper ocean, which is very closely linked to our work package on air sea fluxes. We have a lot of fun things to use to get access to the field and um, to deploy. And um, of course, getting access to the Southern Ocean is very important. And we'll be using the South African National Antarctic Program's SA Gullis II, a new icebreaker, uh, relatively new, um, that uh, together with the Polar Stern that has plans for uh, cruises that Mario will explain in a moment, uh, together with the, the deployment of a bunch of platforms uh, that can autonomously navigate uh, or lagrangianly drift with the ocean, such as the Carioca Drifter, and collect these observations while we can't be there on a ship during these harsh autumn and winter conditions. Uh, one of the major um, parts of this work package is also the deployment of sail drones. Uh, they have, uh, as I showed earlier, circumnavigated Antarctica recently. The standard wing that they have, this one on the left, didn't do very well in the big storms of the Southern Ocean and broke. And so sail drone have been developing a new square rigger uh, sail that can endure these tough conditions uh, on the surface of the Southern Ocean. Uh, very recently, this data from last year on the circumnavigation shows that this deployment of these platforms, such as sail drone, gives us a lot of data thousands and thousands of new data points giving us new information about air sea fluxes. And these provide these just from one platform, these wonderful time series of uh, things like wind speeds and atmospheric forcing, uh, heat fluxes, and as well as the surface ocean measurements uh, such as currents and gradients in the upper ocean. And these results here are some preliminary findings courtesy of a master's student, Hannah Rosenthal, here in Gothenburg. Now, sail drone has been hard at work uh, developing a new hurricane wing, which is really an extreme weather version of sail drone that can survive uh, and work very well in places like the harsh Southern Ocean. And so they have got a number of great uh, measurements uh, sensors that have been integrated that really fit very well with uh, making the observations that are an objective of SOCHIC, uh, such as radiometers, anemometers for wind speeds, air temperature and relative humidity, pH and carbon systems, and then CTD measurements and ADCP to look at the ocean properties uh, and how they may impact air sea fluxes. So we're very excited to use these, these kind of platforms, sail drone and many other autonomous platforms as a core part of collecting observations within SOCHIC. Uh, as an opportunity, I'll take this chance to advertise some new recruitments um, that are coming along. And I really uh, ask that you keep an eye out on the space because new recruitments are popping up in all the different work packages of SoChic all the time. And uh, the specific two that are on the go right now is an, a postdoc opportunity in carbon at CSIR in South Africa, and also a PhD uh, looking at uh, heat fluxes in the University of Gothenburg here. Excuse the long uh, web link, but hopefully later you'll be able to catch a copy of this and scribble this down if you were interested in applying. And very lastly, if any of you are interested in fluxes in the Southern Ocean, you may already be part of a working group called SOFLUX, which is a capability working group of, of SUS, Southern Ocean Observing System. And you could go to their website to register if you wanted to be a member and receive information about uh, air sea fluxes in the Southern Ocean. This working group has been going since 2015 um, and it's been a great way by which to interact with the flux community in the Southern Ocean, coordinate observations, give us new information about new studies and even a number of joint publications have come out of these working groups uh, through new collaborations. Now that's all the time I have uh, for today to introduce uh, the sort of physical fluxes side of work package one. And uh, now it's my chance to hand over to Mario at RV, who is going to be able to give us some more insights about the CO2 fluxes within this work package.
Um, Mario, I will stop sharing my screen and let you take over. Okay. Thank you very much, Seth. I think my screen is coming now, right? Um, okay, uh, we're moving on to uh, the CO2 part of work package one of SOCHIC. And um, yeah, what's better than start uh, when you're talking about PCO2, about the partial pressure of CO2 in the, in the ocean with this uh, figure of um, Takahashi, uh, iconic figure um, from his uh, seminal paper in 2009. It uh, gives the annual air sea CO2 fluxes for the nominal year 2000. Uh, this is uh, based on, on, you could say, only uh, 3 million uh, data points. And we, we, of course, there is a lot of uh, interpolation being done there. Uh, for the Southern Ocean, if we, if we uh, focus on the Southern Ocean, we see, we see the far south, we see the green colors, which means that the net flux is about zero. A little bit uh, to the north of that, we have more the yellow colors, which means there is uh, some outgassing there. And even and somewhat further to the north, in the northern boundaries of the, of the Southern Ocean, it is, uh, the colors are more like blue-like, which means that it, there is quite some, some uptake of CO2 there. Okay, the next one. Um, yeah, okay. Um, it's a very nice database that Takashi has been collecting and he has continued with that. Uh, and in parallel, there was, a, was an effort uh, called SOCAT, Surface Ocean CO2 Atlas. Mm -hmm. And um, they collected all the CO2 data from, from many uh, investigators on PCO2. And in the mean, and this this has been going on for more than ten years, led by Dorothee Bakker from uh, University of East Anglia in England. And in the meantime, um, more than uh, twenty eight million PCO two data points have been collected, uh, covering the period uh, 1956, 57 to two thousand nineteen. And uh, there are um, updates every year of SOCAT. Um, yeah, as we see, uh, there's a lot of data. Um, on the other hand, one should say uh, in the, most of it is in the northern hemisphere and around uh, the, the equator, but still not very much, not very much data in the Southern Ocean. Next one. So now we're uh, coming closer to our area of investigation, which is uh, the Weddell Sea and the Weddell Gyre. And this is uh, the, the PCO2 data that are available in SOCAT uh, version 2019 in a, in a Weddell gyre. And as you see, there's, this is not a lot. And uh, the, the distribution is, um, is not regular. I mean, there are quite some areas where there is uh, hardly any data at all. And then one should uh, know that, uh, of course, the PCO2 in the, in the ocean is not constant. I mean, it, it has a, a clear seasonal course uh, where, for example, in, in summer, when there is a, where, when there is a lot of uh, biological activity taking up CO2, the PCO2 goes down. So we have low, most of the time, low PCO2 in the summer. And in the winter, the PCO2 is much higher because of deep, deep mixing of the ocean, which mixes up uh, deep, deeper water, subsurface water with a high PCO2. So there is quite some variation in the PCO2. So if you want to um, determine fluxes of CO2, annual fluxes, you need quite a lot of data. And um, not only over, the, over temporary, uh, um, not only over the, the whole region, but also over all the seasons. Next. Okay, so we, we don't have that much data. And um, of course, what you, what you can do then um, is take, take other data, um, which um, are more abundant and which have some relation to CO2 and then um, analyze those data with statistical methods. And um, here is um, some data from uh, the, 
uh, article by Brown et al. Um, where this has been done by, by Peter Lanschutzer. And uh, this is a neural network approach. And, and with this approach, you can get also fluxes of CO2. And what we're showing here, uh, the, the, the top figure is uh, for the uh, austral winter. And the figure below that is for austral spring. So that's September, October, November. And you see there's a lot of white, which means there is hardly any fluxes there. And of course, um, most of uh, the, the region, the reason for that, for that is mostly that there is a lot of ice then. And when there is ice, uh, there is the assumption that, that there is hardly any CO2 exchanging between the ocean and the atmosphere. Next one. Yeah, this CO2 under the ice, that's, uh, that's a, different, a different and difficult question. Here is again a data from uh, the Takahashi paper uh, where he collected data from under the ice and put it uh, um, in a plot against the day of the year. And uh, we see that during the winter and into the spring that uh, the PCO2 is tending to increase under the ice, which uh, one could explain because of uh, entrainment of deep water more and more during winter and into spring, which causes the, the high values in the surface. And um, at the end of, of winter and the end of spring, when the ice disappears, uh, one would expect here very high values of CO2 in the surface water, which would mean outgassing of CO2. Next one. But okay, um, outgassing is of course only when um, the, the CO2 is, is that high. And this is, this is from another study. Um, to the left is uh, data from a small transact in the Weddell Sea uh, on the 8th to the 10th of December. And to the right is uh, the same transact, but then about 10, year, 10, 10 days later. And we see in, um, in the beginning, uh, there is supersaturation of CO2. So we have high CO2, but we also have quite some, some ice coverage then, the third, um, the third panel from above. And only 10 days later, the PCO2, it's, it's called uh, FCO2 fugacity here, which is about the same as the partial pressure. Uh, we see that uh, within these 10 years, 10, 10 days, sorry, um, the, the PCO2 has decreased by about 10 to 25 microatmosphere. Also, the ice has melted. So after ice coverage, ice melt, there's a very rapid decrease of uh, the PCO2, which means that there, there can't be a lot of outgassing going on there. Next one. Uh, going back to uh, to the data of uh, CO2 in the Weddell Sea, um, you've seen the, uh, the the map with it. This this is the climatology of the CO2 saturation, where the saturation is defined here as uh, the PCO2 in the ocean divided by the PCO2 in the atmosphere, which means that if we have saturation with when the, the value in the atmosphere and the ocean is exactly the same, we have a value of one. If the value is above one, we have a supersaturation. So it means uh, more CO2 in the, at, in, in, in the ocean and in the atmosphere. And in, if, if we have uh, a saturation below one, we have undersaturation, which means the ocean is a potential sink. Okay, what we also expect is indeed what we see here. So in, in Austral, um, summer, so January, February, March also, we have quite low values, which means the ocean is taking up uh, CO2. But in winter, July, August, September, uh, we have supersaturation. And after winter into spring, uh, the supersaturation is going down again. So if we would assume that, that we don't have much outgassing in winter, and we have quite some undersaturation in summer when there is no ice, we would of course expect that we have, that we have an uptake 
in the weather seed. Of course, this is all the data we have. This, this did not have any uh, statistical treatment. It's just the data there is. Next one. Okay, we have uh, PCU2 there. We have temporal variabil uh, variability, seasonal variability, but there is also uh, decadal variability, which has been shown here, for example, in a, a paper by Kepler and Lanschitzer. Um, in the 1980s, 90s, um, the sink uh, looks like the sink has been uh, decreasing. It's, it's called the saturation period. Uh, you should see it uh, to the to the left. You see that the stronger sink is is downwards, and um, we see towards the year 2000, 2002, um, the sink is is decreasing. And then after that, around 2002, there was a, a reinvigoration period. The sink is increasing again quite well until about. Uh, 2012, where it looks like that the sink is decreasing again. So we have quite some decadal variability in the in the Southern Ocean sink. And what we also see here, there are there's, uh, dif uh, different lines here. These are the different sectors of the Southern Ocean. So there's also quite some variation in the sectors of the Southern Ocean. And uh, green here is the, is the Atlantic sector. And um, because of the differences in the different sectors, uh, this is also one of the reasons that we uh, focus on one, and that is the Atlantic sector. It's one of the reasons. Next. Okay, I'll come to uh, our specific objectives in the SOCIC work package one for CO2. So we are um, interested in the PCO2 under the ice. Um, it may be that there is that this is not not very important, but uh, we would we would like to know if that is really the case. Um, we would like to uh, get uh, the full fluxes for the Weddell C and the Weddell Gyre, both in the data and in the model. As we have seen, uh, we don't have that many data. We want to collect new data, also from different times of the year, and we want to uh, compare them with model data and uh, calculate annual fluxes using data and the model. Then, uh, as we've seen, there, there can be quite some differences between the different sectors of the Southern Ocean. Uh, we want to compare the Weddell Sea and the Weddell Gyre with the remaining Southern Ocean and see if, uh, if that is different or not. And of course, that has to be done with a model. And the fourth um, objective has to do with the, the partial pressure value um, of the water that is uh, involved in, um, in the uh, ventilation uh, of the, the deep water formation at the deep water formation site, where the deep water and the bottom water is formed in, in the Weddell Sea. Of course, where this is formed, it takes CO2 with it. Uh, it, it contains the deep, the, the bottom water contains CO2 and um, the pCO2 difference between the water and the atmosphere at that place, of course, determines how much CO2 is taken up and how much CO2 goes into um, the bottom water, the new form bottom water. So we, it's very important to know what pCO2 is, can be, can be found there. This is also one of our objectives. Next one. Okay, what, what are we going to do? What are our methods? I'm going to present some here. Uh, first is um, we want to have new PCO2 measurements as much as we can and wherever possible. And uh, yeah, the first way to do that is use uh, research vessels, for example, here, Polarstern, and also the, the research vessel, the South African vessel, Seth mentioned it, the Agalas II. Uh, we have a general oceanic system on board, which measures continuously the pCO2 in the surface water. Next one. Uh, these are two expeditions that are planned. In the, there, are, there are more planned, but these, these are the, the next two. 
Uh, the first one is here in February, March 2021, which is quite soon. And uh, it's kind of surprising in, in these COVID times that this uh, is going to take place, but it is uh, actually planned. It's, it's the Cosmos um, expedition of Polarstein. It's going uh, to the very south of the Weddell Sea, the Filthy Runner ice shelf, and in front of that, and this is, these are the regions here where, where the bottom water is formed. So uh, we, we will get PCO2 data from a very important place where there's hardly any data. So we are going to places where no one have been, kind of, kind of. Uh, the other uh, cruise uh, also with Polarstein here is planned for uh, next year, December, uh, 21 to January 22. Hopefully the situation with COVID is better than. This is a cruise that has been done uh, other times as well in, in the past. And we're again, we're going to collect many, many new data and also uh, going part of it uh, to the south where there's not that much data. Next one. Okay, another way uh, You've heard everything about sail drone or a lot of, of uh, sail drone uh, by SEP, but yeah, sail drone has a PC2 sensor. So this is also a very good way of collecting new PC2 data in the weather gyre and also in, in other um, seasons than where, they, where the, the research ships go there. Next. This is uh, another method that we're going to use. These are the Carioca drifters uh, that will be done by Jacqueline Boutin uh, from Paris. Um, it, the uh, Carioca drifters have to be uh, deployed by ships. So the ship brings them there and they throw them into, into the water. It measures uh, the PCO2, or it's called here FCO2, CO2 fugacity here with quite a good accuracy. And of course, uh, other ancillary um, variables like the sea surface temperature, salinity, fluorescence, and oxygen, which are also very useful for interpreting PCO2 data in the surface. Also, the uh, atmospheric um, variables are measured here. And uh, one should say that uh, the trajectory of these uh, drifters is influenced by depth currents up to 50 meters depth and uh, they have a lifetime of 12 to 18 months. They have to be in open water. So it's, you can't use them in, in the ice, in the sea ice. Next. And then the last uh, thing I'm presenting here. Uh, so we have the modeling. This is just, uh, just an example of uh, what a model can show. It is a model uh, of uh, the South Africans of around uh, Pedro Montero. 10 kilometers resolution. Um, yeah, what do we do with that? Um, um, so they have done runs uh, for 1998 to 2015, complete runs. And uh, for um, our project here, they will do runs uh, until 2020 also. Um, yeah, there will be initial estimates of the variability of the air sea fluxes of CO2 using the model. And they, those will be analyzed against um, data. Um, the uncertainties will be determined with the model and uh, the model will be used to uh, get a hold on the drivers of the interannual variability of CO2. So, and now um, we're going further with uh, Ryan Ward, who's going to present a very sp special uh, method of our project in our work package. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Okay, so um, let me go to the next slide. Um, so 
one of the objectives that uh, Seb mentioned was we want to relate the uh, dissipation rate, so the turbulence to uh, the air sea fluxes. And um, uh, heretofore, much of the effort in relating air sea fluxes to environmental factors have been related through wind speed. So this is four common parameterizations. Some of them are uh, more relevant, are more recent, and, and some of them are, are uh, somewhat out of date. But the, the key message here is that from these four parameterizations, they mostly agree at up to eight meters per second. But when the wind speed uh, increases to above 10 meters per second, these parameterizations diverge. And so therefore, this is a key parameter for um, uh, determining how much um, uh, carbon dioxide is being exchanged between the ocean and the atmosphere. So uh, one of the uh, leading scientists, Rick Wanikoff, um, has indicated that wind is really just a proxy for turbulence. And it's turbulence that drives the fluxes across the air-sea interface. So if we go to the next slide. So this is a, um, um, a schematic of, of what's happening. So you see that the fluxes uh, of CO2 can be driven either into the ocean or out of the ocean, depending on whether the PCO2 in the ocean is greater or less than the atmosphere. So that determines the direction of the flux. Uh, but what drives the flux is the turbulence at the air-sea interface. And so turbulence in the upper ocean is created by different processes. So wind is one of the primary factors for the production of turbulence. Waves is another, and buoyancy. So together, these three different processes are responsible for the creation of turbulence in the upper ocean, which drives the fluxes. So there's a model that's been around since the 70s, which uh, is an alternative method for determination of what this K parameter is, or the transfer velocity. And the transfer velocity is one of the big uh, unknowns, uh, trying to parameterize or accurately determine what the transfer velocity is, is, is what allows us to cr um, create global flux maps. And so what we want to do is rather than measure wind speed and apply those to the determination of the fluxes, we want to measure turbulence at the uh, ocean surface. And so that leads us to how do we measure ocean, tur uh, ocean turbulence? So if we go to the next slide, so we have developed uh, this um, uh, instrument called the Air-Sea Interaction Profiler. You can see the two uh, photographs of it on the right. These are on the cover of JGR in 2014 and GRL in 2015. It's essentially an autonomous microstructure vertical profiling instrument that provides data from 100 meters depth to the surface. And it allows, it, allows us to, be, uh, to, to make these measurements in, in an uh, undisturbed flow. So we, we minimize the flow uh, on the environment, or minimize the disturbance on the environment. So if we go to the next slide, this is a movie of uh, ASIP. Uh, it was made in a, um, in a tank in Brest. So they have a tank that's 10 meters deep. And we were testing this uh, a few years ago. Um, so it operates by turning on thrusters at the base of the instrument. Those thrusters pull ASIB down to a predetermined depth. So we program it to typically to go below the mixed layer depth. So the mixed layer depth is depending on where you are and what season, it's of the order of 100 meters. Uh, so we'd go down to below the mixed layer depth and then we come back up. And as the instrument is ascending through the water column, uh, we we um, we were making measurements from so from below the mixed layer all the way to the surface. Uh, it's fully uh, autonomous, so we essentially put it out over the side, and um, the ship goes off for one day, one to two days, and uh, continues to do other operations. We have communication with ASA via satellite, so it updates us on its position. And when we're ready to recover it after the batteries have been depleted, we uh, bring the ship over to that position, launch a small boat and pick it up. So in the next slide, we'll see some of the operations uh, here. So on the bottom right, you'll see that um, this was a recovery operation with ASAP uh, on the NOR. It's a Woods Hole ship in 2011 in the North Atlantic. 
Uh, we essentially launch a small boat, drive over to pick up the instrument, haul it into the small boat, the rib, and then the rib is recovered onto the ship with the instrument on board. Once it gets on board, we have to recharge the batteries, uh, offload the data, and typically that takes, at least for this version of the instrument, that takes uh, about 12 hours. On the bottom left, you'll see a movie that was made of the of Asa ascending through the water column. This was in the subtropics, so we had very clear water. I think it dove to a depth of about 50 meters. And so you can see it ascending through the water column here. It takes about three minutes to get down to 50 meters and back up to the surface. And so you'll also see that the, um, the, the end cap is populated with a suite of sensors. These are the uh, commercially available, the most high resolution sensors available. So we, we typically purchase these shear probes, which will allow us to determine the turbulence or the dissipation rate of turbulent kinetic energy, as well as high resolution conductivity and temperature sensors. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So I'll briefly provide a, a, um, some data that we um, acquired in 2011. This was, again, the, the cruise in the North Atlantic. We had four deployments of ASIP. Uh, for each deployment, it was out for about 24 hours. And the objectives during this cruise was to study air-sea gas exchange and the processes that control it. So if we go to the next slide, during this cruise, you can see that there's a, um, we, we encountered a low pressure system. So on the bottom, uh, you see a record of the wind speed and the wave height. So in blue, the wind speed, uh, you can see after um, a few hours, the wind drops off from 10 meters per second down to four meters per second. So we essentially enter the, the, uh, the eye of the low pressure system the wind speed remained low for several hours and then very rapidly increased to 17 meters per second. And so in the next slide, I'll show you what the response of the ocean was. So here, the, um, again, we have the wind speed in the upper wind speed and, and uh, significant wave height in the upper plot. Uh, and the lower plot shows the measurements of dissipation from ASAP from a depth of 40 meters up to the surface. So the, the color bar indicates high turbulent regions. So the red, red regions are high turbulence and the blue regions are low turbulence. And so what I found uh, interesting about this slide was that the, um, the turbulence in the ocean is mainly driven by wind. So you see that when the wind drops from 10 meters per second at about uh, 20, 100 hours to four meters per second, the response of the uh, ocean is almost instantaneous. So you see the dissipation uh, very quickly dying off. And then you see towards the end at about five in the morning, the wind speed increasing and the dissipation or turbulence in the upper ocean uh, is uh, it almost instantly responds to this. We also have shown estimates here of the mixed layer depth, which we get from the density measurements on ASIP as well as the mixing layer depth, which we derive from the dissipation measurements. And you can see these two length scales are uh, quite different. And, and this is where we have some overlap between work package one and work package two on the uh, SOCIAC project. So if we go to the next slide, um, we're currently developing a new version of ASIP. In fact, uh, I have, I'm sitting in the lab here and you can see here in the background, this is the uh, the, the newest version of ASIP. So I'm currently working on programming the, uh, some of the uh, microcontrollers on board. And um, this is a fairly significant technical improvement over its predecessor. So for example, we can extend the depth down to 200 meters. Uh, instead of having three thrusters to, um, to submerge the instrument for this new version, we've got an oil-filled buoyancy engine, which means that we can um, make it um, positively or negatively buoyant, depending on where we, um, uh, the oil in the, in, the, uh, in the two reservoirs are located inside ASAP or outside ASAP. So you're essentially changing the density of the instrument. Uh, we can also uh, maintain neutral buoyancy at whatever depth we wish. We have a new data acquisition system. So this is a state machine. 
uh, very uh, precise uh, piece of engineering that allows us to acquire all the data from the sensors. We've added new sensors, uh, so we're not only making dissipation measurements, temperature conductivity, but also velocity measurements. Uh, we've improved shipboard handling. We can turn the instrument around in one hour as opposed to 12 hours. So instead of recharging the batteries, we can swap out the batteries. Uh, and then while ASIP has been redeployed, we'll recharge the old ones and they'll be ready for uh, the, the next uh, turnaround. We also have the flexibility to add new sensors as we wish, so we can make biological measurements or chemical measurements. So the next slide I think is my conclusions. Uh, turbulence is a dominant exchange process. This is often parameterized by wind speed, but in this case we're going to measure the turbulence directly and we're going to relate this to the CO2 fluxes. The air-sea interaction profiler was specifically designed to capture these processes at the air-sea interface. So we go from below the mix layer up to the surface. Uh, our current depth range is 100 meters, which covers most mix layer depths, but the new uh, instrument will go down to 200 meters. And ASA will make a contribution to the SOSHIC project by furthering our understanding of oceanic turbulence and its role on air-sea fluxes. So a final slide I have is a brief um, uh, advertisement for some positions available. So I have a PhD uh, fellowship for measurements during SOSHIC, but there are two other PhD studentships available. One is for stereo imaging of waves. The other is for a project that we'll be working on in the Labrador Sea. And then finally, there's a postdoc for a new microfluidics ocean carbon sensor. So if you, anybody's interested, please contact me by email. And that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, uh, Seb and Mario as well. Um, we now have a bit of time for some questions. Um, so if you have any questions, the, you should be able to find a Q&A box, a button at the bottom of your screen somewhere, and you can type those in there. Otherwise, there is a raise, uh, raise hand feature which you can use if you'd like to um to ask your question by audio um we have one question i think in the the chat box um from antonio it's directed towards mario um he asks um are these uh, the runs available public and um, can we uh, can we link to them, them into SOSHI back end data infrastructure? Um, I think um, we have to contact uh, Pedro Pedro for that. I can't give an answer to this. We, we it can be discussed offline. Is is, is what you mean? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, we have a couple of people with their hands raised. So, uh, Alexandra, I'm going to allow you to speak and you can ask your question over the audio. If you uh, unmute yourself, you should be able to uh, speak. Sorry, I think that was a mistake that the hand was raised. Oh, okay. Never mind. Thank you anyway. Uh, we have uh, another hand raise, uh, Bastian. I'll allow you to speak. Um, I raised my hand by mistake. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you as well. Um, never mind. Um, okay, we've got uh, Simon. Hopefully, you did this on purpose. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. I raised mine deliberately and I had my miss some of this, but I got, I think I got most of it. Um, enjoyed the talks and Seb, um, I was curious, the, uh, sort of latest sail drone that you showed, um, the, the long wave instrument seemed to be positioned slightly strangely relative to the short wave instrument. The short wave was right on top of the, of the mast and the, and the long wave was on the sort of, uh, on the board itself. Is there a reason for that? apart from the space, lack of space or? A... Yeah, it's purely um, a design issue around lack of space on top of the wing of the uh, sail drone, which um, 
in order to not interfere with other radiometer or micro meteorological measurements, um, they had a lot of space on the hull, which allowed for the long wave sensor to be installed there. And the, the um, testing that's been done is, uh, points towards that there is little interference on the long wave radiation information when it's placed here and quite far away from the sail. Uh, compared okay. to the shortwave radiation sensor, which you really want to be as high up and away from any um, uh, obstacles that might cause shadowing or reflection into the uh, sensor itself for the radiometer measurements. Yeah. There, I guess there ideally is, they'd be side by side, but yeah, you have to compromise somewhere. Yeah, it's a compromise on such platforms since we're, you know, um, this is really a new area for collecting these observations. There's a compromise around space uh, for these instruments to sit side by side. Um, and it's obviously, I mean, these, these are going to be really new measurements. And uh, these measurements haven't been collected with this current sail drone that has a hurricane wing, uh, but it has been on, on the standard sail drones in the, in the tropical Pacific with Megan Cronin and PML yeah. and many others. Um, and, and I, they would, we would be able to, we, we collaborate with them in terms of their helping us also calibrate these sensors at PMEL. So yeah. it'll be very important to engage with them to understand what interference this might cause on uh, the long wave radiation sensor, for example. Yeah, for sure. It just caught my eyes, it went past and yeah, but that's good to hear what you just said. And it's nice to see those time series as well that your master's students got out, that looked very interesting. Yeah, it's, um, it's great. It's a lot of data to understand and process. Um, and so it's very interesting. And we're learning a lot about what these sail drones and other autonomous platforms can, can observe well. And the assumptions that we have to take into account by how they sample as well. Um, since they are so impacted by the surface motion and their speed is impacted by the wind strength um, when they have a sail, and all of these has some impact on actually how you, what you're interpreting in the data, which has to be carefully treated. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Simon. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the question box. Um, again, for Mario from, from Pat. Um, it says, uh, you mentioned the importance of seasonal cycle and lack of winter data. Does this have implications for uncertainties in the long-term trends you discussed, i.e. does the anal do analyses somehow try to take into account the missing winter data? A very good question. Um, I think, um, of course, um, if you use uh, methods like uh, neural networks, uh, then for, for getting data in, in winter, the uncertainty definitely will be, will be bigger. That's, that's a fact. And on the other hand, for the, for the, southern, uh, for the southern Ocean, and, and especially for the far south, where there's a lot of ice, that will probably not have a very big um, effect. Uh, it may have a, a larger effect in the, in the open ocean regions. On the other hand, there may also be somewhat more data from the open ocean regions in winter because ice is often uh, um, yeah, a problem for, for going into, in there into, into winter. So I, I think um, it, it has an effect, although I don't know exactly uh, how big the effect will be. And uh, as to the, the, the second question about the succum flow data, um, I, of course, uh, they're great, and they give a lot of a lot of new data. Also, in winter, uh, that's that's the, the the very great benefit of these floats that uh, that they also provide a lot of winter data. And already uh, have they shown that uh, that some 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 surprises if you compare uh, the the SOCOM data from winter with the data that were available in SOCAT. Uh, there has already been some, some quite some differences shown. So yeah, SOCOM is really, really a great, great project and it helps us uh, to fill these gaps, definitely. Great. Um, 
There is not any questions coming in just at the moment, but keep them coming if you have them. Uh, in the meantime, I have a question um, for Brian. Um, how does the ASIP um, system, how does it uh, handle ice-covered waters? Is it, is it possible to deploy it in, uh, in ice-covered waters or, or does it struggle there? Um, we've never deployed it under ice. We've deployed it close to the marginal ice zone in the Arctic in 2014, but um, it's not designed to operate under the ice. I mean, I, the danger is that it would, uh, it would be impossible to recover if it got evacuated under the ice. But I think it would be very interesting to make um, profiles under the ice and, and allow the profiler to come right up into the, uh, into the slush zone just below the ice. I think the sensors would survive. We could probably reconfigure the guard for that. But the challenge would be then both deployment and recovery. So, you know, we've had discussions or thoughts about this that maybe if we could um, go onto an ice sheet and dig a hole in the ice and deploy the instrument, but we'd need divers down there then to, or a tether to recover. And we, we tend not to tether it because that interferes with the profiling um, and can cause um, uh, cause the, the instrument to vibrate and then that gets, uh, infects the, the turbulence, the shear probe measurements and therefore our ability to estimate uh, the dissipation. But I think if we had a, a, a dedicated effort, um, I mean, that would be a project on its own. It would be very, very interesting to take profiles below the ice all the way up to up to, you know, just below the, I mean, going down below the mixed layer under the ice and then up to the surface again. I would like to try it one day. Yeah, so potential for something else, yeah. Yeah, right. Great, um, we have, Marcel has his hand raised, so I'm going to allow you to talk. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, I have a question for Brian. Um, hi, Brian. Hey, Marcel. Uh, I'd like to talk. Um, I'm just thinking about the depth rating for the ASIP and um, thinking of the sort of hydrography of the Weddell Sea in the summer. You've got the winter water layer, which can perhaps extend a little bit below 100 meters. So I'm wondering, is it possible to go a bit deeper to try and capture the, capture the base of that layer? Well, the new version, we've extended the depth range to 200 meters. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the, you know, you specify the depth and the engineer, you know, uh, makes the, the housing as thick to, to rate it to whatever depth. So um, the initial or the version, the current version of ASIP was rated to 100 meters. And the, the risk going below that is that you'll, you'll end up crushing it. Um, I think it probably would survive to 150 meters, but you take a risk. Yeah. Um, but the new version, it's rated to 200 meters. So, you know, the, the plan is to uh, have that operational by uh, the next Sochi cruise in January 2022, um, 15 months away. Uh, so we will most definitely be able to go below 100 meters, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Let me know. And if everything works out, we may have the two instruments with us. And there's no reason to believe we won't. So that, you know, gives us twice the potential, while well, one of them being down to 100 meters, but the new version down to 200 meters. But it means that we'll get surface dissipation measurements with two instruments and, you know, more data is better. So fingers crossed yeah. that that can be worked out for the next cruise. Cool, thanks. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Marcel. Um, in the chat box, uh, we have, it's not, not a question, but a message from, from Sarah, who says um, that they are completing a paper on the 10 kilometer resolution forced regional model, and the output will be available after publication. So um, there's yeah there's there's other work going on elsewhere in the in the community that's uh, contributing to this this uh, stuff in, in the presentations. 
Um, I can't see another question just at the moment, but I will ask another one myself to Seb. Um, you mentioned the, the due to the cruise being postponed, um, well, the cruise is being postponed due to coronavirus. Um, will this have any effect? Is, is there are any of the data that you are hoping to collect, are they, they time critical or, or are they, will, will it be fine if uh, you, know, you collect that data a year later? Yeah, not a simple question uh, per se, but because there's so many elements. Um, uh, my answer to it is that, well, we have some ongoing recruitments and people that have been put in place that would have wanted to use this data, researchers and students and postdocs, um, who won't be able to immediately work on that data, but the data is expected to still come online in all of their, you know, um, during all of the positions that they have. And so, there will be an ability to still use that data. And the bonus is that we do have quite a lot of existing data um, that is really requiring to be worked up anyway. Um, and it's gonna be able to, we, we'll be able to put those efforts into using that um, currently available data. And that really ranges from uh, everything from uh, the ship data that we have historically for a number of years that uh, Mario, for example, also raised in his talk to a lot of other autonomous platform data from um, some of the people who are directly in this consortium from South Africa or here in Gothenburg um, have been deploying in those kind of autonomous platforms in those regions that can be used. And then there's reanalysis and model data that we can start to, to look at. Um, so a lot of the objectives could be achieved um, uh, with current data, and then we hope to really enhance those objectives and, and reach all of them when we collect um, the really undertake the field work from the SOSIC field work starting next year, later next year, as planned. Great. So there's a whole uh, suite of approaches to the to the objectives. So um, COVID hasn't completely derailed the plans, really. No, I, I mean, it's a pity that this had to happen. And, you know, it's uh, kind of expected given, um, you know, all the delays we have in supply chain for sensors, calibrations, people traveling, a lot of questions around that. And then obviously the operations of the vessels themselves to get down there. And, um, but we are now really in a planning phase uh, within SOCHIC and talking to the European Commission on how best to do this and where to extend some of the project time to, make this happen um, and we hope that that you know those negotiations and planning will go very well for so chic so we can really reach all our objectives that we still hope to 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 get great um i can't see any further questions coming in um so oh pat has raised his hand just as i said that so <laughs> that's how you snuck in just as i was about to call an end i'd like you to speak now there you go If you unmute yourself, we should be able to hear you. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I had a question for Bob, if that's all right. I just wondered whether the profiler would uh, tell you something useful about the role of Langmuir turbulence in the Southern Ocean, which is um, obviously quite a hot, hot topic for parameterization and models. Um, you know, yeah. Whether it would be able to tell you something about the counter-rotating cells associated with the Langmuir or whether it that wouldn't be observed, in particular the downdrafts, I think. Yeah, so Langmuir circulations, I, I think that um, uh, we have never observed them. Um, but we did do an analysis on, um, there was a model proposed by Stephen Belcher in 2012. Um, and it, it uh, took into account uh, three sources of turbulence from wind waves and buoyancy. And we had enough observations from this cruise in 2011 um, that we were able to test the model and compare it directly to our observations. And um, one thing we found was that the, the length scale derived using dissipation as opposed to density. So we called it the mixing layer depth as opposed to the mixed layer depth. 
the model actually did better when we used that land scale. So, um, and, and this model had Langmuir turbulence very much at the core of, its, uh, uh, of, of the model itself. Um, but Langmuir circulation, um, I, think, I think we probably, it would be difficult to be able to see whether we're, we're, we're seeing something like that in our data. Um, I, I'm, you know, it, it may be that a time series of an ADCP pointing upwards from a depth of, uh, say, 10 meters would be a more appropriate method for that. Um, but, uh, you know, it remains to be seen. If, if we do see a significant amount of Lamier circulation in the Southern Ocean, perhaps when we, uh, if we have photographic evidence of it and we can match it up with uh, when the profiler is deployed in that region, then we might be able to pick out what the uh, that signal looks like. So that's something that would certainly be worth trying. Thanks for that question. Great, thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Pat. Um, and with that, I can't see any further questions, so I will draw a close to the webinar. Um, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I think it's been a very fruitful discussion and, and, uh, and wonderful presentation. So thank you very much, of course, to Seb, uh, Mario and Brian. Um, the webinar has been recorded, so you can relive every moment as a, another time. Uh, and you can also, that will be on the SoChic YouTube channel, uh, where you can also find the first webinar in, in this series, which gave an overview of the whole SoChic project um, from the coordinator, uh, Jean-Baptiste Sallet. Um, and there will be more webinars coming in this series, so uh, keep, uh, keep your eyes peeled for those. Um, Without further ado, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are. Okay. Bye bye.